For joining me today is Tanya Fincham. Today is Monday, April 25th, 2011, and we're here in Grand, Oklahoma, interviewing Ann Vick and her husband. Ooh, let me start again. <laughs> interviewing Ann Vick and her son, JP. Ooh. Okay. John, for John Paul. John Paul. Uh, about their Centennial Farm as part of our Centennial Farm Families Oral History Project. And let me get the name of this farm right. It is the Bar TJ Ranch. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, and let's begin by learning a little more about you and your family. How did your family come to Oklahoma? Well, actually, I was the first one to come to Oklahoma. Uh, after I married my husband, in Morocco, which was in those days French Morocco. And he had come with the uh, with, uh, company, American company, uh, Morrison Knudsen, who had the contracts, this was after World War II, and they had the contract with the Corps of Engineers to build bases in uh, all over Europe, which they did. And they had five, they were going to, they built five bases in Morocco, which again was French Morocco. Uh, I was born in Morocco because my parents were from Spain, from northern Spain, came uh, on honeymoon to Morocco and literally fell in love with it. It's a beautiful country. It reminds me a lot of uh, Southern California. So, uh, so my father, who was a pharmacist, decided to buy a pharmacy and stay there with his wife and, and raise a family there. So that's how come I was born in Casablanca, Morocco. Well, 20 some years later, I met my husband who had arrived with the Corps of Engineers and the, and the Morrison Knudsen Company to build bases in Morocco. And we met and of course fell in love and got married there. And this was 50, we had been, we, we, when he passed away, we had been married, I think, 56 years. How we, did you meet your husband? Well, in those days, I was out on my first job after college in the consulate of Argentina. And they gave a party, a reception. And my husband, who was staying in City uh, Slimane, a base the Americans were building in those days, and I think his roommate, who was European, uh, in, was invited at that reception also, and he he brought my husband, and that's where we met. I think the roommate was supposed to be my date, but <laughs> we changed things around, and uh, we were married. We were engaged maybe about oh, maybe four or five months later and married probably a year, a year later. And, and where did you get married? We got married first in Rabat, in the in Saint, uh, Saint Francis Catholic Church. And then we were also married at the American Embassy in Tangier, Morocco, okay. to be sure that things were legal. And uh, after that, of course, we had a honeymoon and we went back to Morocco. He had to finish his contract. And from them, the company sent him for another, oh, I think we stayed four years in Iran, building also bases and things like that, and, and highways. But meanwhile, we were coming, at least once a year, we were coming back to Oklahoma to visit. And uh, in those days, uh, his parents were still alive. He, uh, he lost one young brother in, uh, what was the, the Korean war? Korean war. Huh? Korean. What? The Korean war. No, it was not the Korean, it was before that. Indochina, I think it was. Uh, a young brother died there. There were nine children. My, my brother, my husband. So anyway, we spent another four years in Iran and, and uh, we finally came back to stay here. So when you were visiting Oklahoma, where were you going? We were going, well, first of all, we, we stayed, we spent a few days in New York because I had cousins okay. living there. And then we went, we didn't lose any time. We, we came straight to 
to Delaware County. To the farm? Mm -hmm. to, the, to the farm. Yeah, I think what she's getting at is how did the Centennial Farm, how did we acquire the Centennial Farm? How did the family get, oh, well, the Dick the, family come to Oklahoma to get the Centennial Farm? I well, think that was the... That way, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the story she wants. Oh, oh, no. I think that's why they're here, Mom. Well, no, she asked me how I met sure. my husband. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we kept coming every year and staying a few days, and we, we were staying with my in-laws. Oh, oh, what did you think of Oklahoma? Oh, I loved it. I, I, I really loved it. I loved the whole country very, very much. My mother, now I don't know if that interests you or not, but my mother had come in 1904 and had gone with, with uh, her uncle and aunt, who were tourists, and had gone to the, to the St. Fair. Louis World's Fair. World Fair, that's right, in 1904. And so she kept telling me how wonderful the United States were. And she always kept that. And I have the, the dish from 1904. Well, well, tell me a little bit about the Dick family and how they okay. came to acquire the land. Okay, the Dick family, as far as I know, and I might be making mistakes, I go from what my mother-in-law and my husband, it's really a shame that my husband passed away and his brother. They were the two who really knew everything. But we found all those books that we had. So from what I know, they came, or maybe their ancestors came with the Trail of Tears. The and family was in Brasswood, North Carolina. From Georgia. Well, and Brasswood, North Carolina. Yeah, but the, the Dukes came from Georgia. Well, remember when we went to see Jeff Muskrat out in Cherokee, we went, went to Brasswood. Yes. We had, this, we had the roles as to how many goats and cows and things like that they had. So they came over to Trail of Tears and settled in Delaware County and were allotted, and uh, the Indian allotment were allotted acres where the, where the home place is now. Yeah. And I think it goes back to four generations, don't you think? And that, that original Indian allotment was how many acres? I think 60. I, I hear my husband say 60. Yeah, I believe it is 60. Okay, John Paul said that it it's, was... The, 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 the original acre was 60 acres and it's been added to, so the Bar TJ Ranch encompasses about 530 acres today. And it was my dad acquired he acquired the original 60 from his brothers and sisters when his dad passed away, but he had added lands uh, acquired adjoining that over the, since since the 50s. Uh, he would send back money and buy land, or he bought some when he came back. Now, now your husband's family were they farming the land? Yes, his his parents and grandparents were farming the land. They were they raised nine children, of course. As you know, it was not enough to raise a big family. So my father-in-law worked at one time at the dam. Well, where is the dam? Pensacola Dam in Disney. Yes. He worked there for a while. My mother-in-law, who was a wonderful lady, was teaching a one-class school. And that was by Uchi. You know where the, the restaurant is on top of that hill? They may not. We'll show them. The old gray schoolhouse. We'll show them down there. They don't know what they're There in. was what they called the gray schoolhouse. Okay. And it was a one room. Until. But they, but they really didn't. They weren't farmers and such that Western Oklahoma farmers with wheat, uh, corn, things of that nature. This is much more hilly. Uh, it was more raising cattle, uh, farm animals, yeah. and you know, growing what crops they needed to, for, to live. But it wasn't really a but they, what a commercial farm. Yeah, but they always had the garden and sure. all they needed to feed their family and the people who helped them with the with the farm. So in the early days, what what kind of crops are we talking about? And to be quite honest with you, I, I really don't know. I know that uh, the maize and and some wheat, some things that, but it wasn't for commercial use for sales. Uh, and the, the families who had shared with the families. He did not. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. lots of the stories my dad tells me about every, you know, everybody helping everybody else, and always had the house that was built, uh, I believe in 1888, where my granddad was, my, my grand, granddad's dad was born in 1892, my dad was born in 1921, and seven of, six of his eight brothers and sisters were born in that house. 
uh, and he was the third oldest. He was the first boy. Yeah. They had two girls, then one boy, then boys and girls. Um, eight of them were born in that farm. Only the last one, okay, and so. her name is Neoma Sebastian from J. Mm -hmm. Married to Dr. Sebastian, who is a nose dentist, is retired. Was the only one who was born in a hospital around Fairland or Afton, somewhere there. That's the only one. All the others were born. Furthermore, I remember my husband saying that several people came to help their baby at their, at their place because, I don't know, maybe, maybe they were a little bit better off than, you know, financially. Maybe they could afford to. But that house was always full, whether it was their children or somebody else's, or, or they were helping someone who was going to have a baby. You remember Daddy mm -hmm. saying that? Does the house still stand? Yes. Yes, the house stands. And something funny happened, I don't know if I told you. But last week I got uh, from the county assessor saying that they had raised the price. Did I tell you that? Mm -hmm. Anyway. We don't want to tell. That's the word. We may get in trouble. The, they, the, the tax guy may get in trouble for for keeping it where it is, Mom. You may want to I, tell us. I, I called, and uh, they said, "Well, we took pictures of a, a, a house falling apart, and we go back, and they have added to it and put another roof." And I said, "The only reason we are trying it from falling to keep it from falling apart, because it's a centennial house." Mm -hmm. Then he agreed, and he said, "Okay, then forget about it." Well, well, tell me about the old house. Describe it to me. Okay. It had... It, where is that picture? Yeah. It had... Uh, the entrance was... Uh, it's a two-story home. It's, it's a, on a little bench overlooking a valley. It Ice. had the entrance. It was like a living room or a family room. And then it had a kitchen. And upstairs... Upstairs, they had a big bedroom for all the kids, I guess. Luckily, all the kids were not the same age. So, you know, there was three and two, and <laughs> by you, the time my husband left, you know, there were still kids there. Do you know how the house was heated? Fireplace. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they had one big fireplace there that heated oh, yes. pretty much the whole house. So oh, they got yes. pretty cold upstairs. And they yeah. explain, I don't know if it's in this book or one of the books where, the fire, the, the house caught fire many times, but they always, because they had a kitchen with a stove. And, uh, and of course, all the, the smoke and all that came out, but it went to the fireplace, you know, so and the then there would, the, the roof would start on fire. So they would tell the kids, uh, everybody would rush to get the water from the well and put it out. And they put it out every time. It happened several times, but the house never burned out. Hmm. But this happened quite a bit. Hmm. And that's in, in, the, in the books. I don't know that. And how about uh, a water source? The, the well? Mm -hmm. There was a well there. It the well was located to the, let's see, well, to the other, let's, can you hold it up, please? Just okay. on the east side of the house. On the, on the, where that tree is, that's where the, on the end of the house, that's where the well oh. was. The outhouse was on the left side. Okay. And the, <coughs> well, on the opposite side of the house. And next to the well was a beautiful, like I told you, a beautiful rose bush. <coughs> and it disappeared, I don't know why, but I was sorry to but see. But they that. also had some, some um, springs well, that ran 24 or 12 months a year. Never went dry. We had a spring just on the north side of the house, probably about a quarter of a mile. And then there was a couple of creeks, streams that ran about a quarter of a mile south of the house that were more was seasonal. Was that included in the 60 acres? Yes. Okay. The stream was. Uh, Dad acquired the, the land with the, with, the, with the spring later. But when you were in the 1920s and 30s, you went where you wanted to and Dad talks about riding a cow to school because it was a mile away and his cow was warm on those winter days. Yeah. So, you know, things of that nature. It, it's, it's some great stories. That's right. They were after the, after Plus, the I always had horses and cattle, but it, sometimes when he couldn't catch a horse, he'd ride a cow. So. And my mother-in-law, not only did she teach, but she played the piano beautifully. 
She would play the piano for the kids, taught them to dance, because he played, my father-in-law played the, not played, but the fiddle. Mm -hmm. So both of them would play the music while the children tried to dance. And they all have that memory. I remember all my sisters-in-law talking about it, except for the youngest one, of course, she was, I think she was only seven years old, I think, when her mother passed away. Mm -hmm. She died pretty she, she was about 40 years younger than Dad. Huh? She was about 40 years, 35 years younger than Dad. Probably, yeah. I mean, she's, Dad would be 89 now, and she's... I remember because she... Mid-50s? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So I, I'm assuming at that point there's a, no running water in the house. That's right. So how would they get water into the house? Well, they got it out by... My bucket full, like right this. So okay. I don't know. Okay. Um, I think they had a hand pump. No the what? They had a hand pump. Did they? Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you remember stories of when the house got electricity? Oh, yes. It says that. I don't know if it's in this one. The, uh, the well's still there. Still, well still works. Um, I need to get a new pump for it, but it still supplies water and when we need it. Um, the farm is still up until a couple of years ago when we had the ice storms, when it tore down some of our fences. We had cattle and horses still running there until a few years ago, and then uh, all the trees that fell due to the ice storms knocked down, you know, seems like a couple of miles worth of fences. And so we've been in the process of kind of reclaiming our fence lines again and rebuilding the fences, but it's not complete yet, so we can't run cattle and horses again. Quite yet, on here, all of it. Here, they, they interviewed my husband. This is what he says. And he said, Dick said the two-story house was probably one of the most modern of its time. Back then, there was no such thing as electricity or running water. The two-story contained a kitchen and a spacious living room downstairs with a fireplace and a bedroom upstairs. The 28 by 28 foot house held up to eight children at one time not included the not included including the parents they're the one bedroom downstairs behind the living room mm -hmm. and then a couple of years ago as it was you know as dad's health was he'd always kept it up but as his dad health was failing uh realizing that it, you know between termites and it just being 110 or 12 years old um we uh, we went in and, and I had some people come in and help shore it up and put some new put a new brace some new braces in there and roof and some siding and new you know we wanted to preserve it for the next couple of generations yeah so we did that a couple of years ago and and with the you know the ice storms and and the snows that we've had the last couple of years I'm guessing that it probably would have collapsed if we hadn't done that so we got lucky and the timing is everything it says here the family was self sufficient. They milked their own dairy cattle, raised their own crops, lived off the livestock and game. And he said about the mother. The mother was a school teacher while raising a large family, a huge garden and doing household chores. Now your, your husband's father yeah. Was he always a farmer, or did he have a job outside of the well, house? He was the, he was the one job. that worked on the on the dam. Okay, He's a so worker. he was a carpenter. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, so he wasn't solely farm. a farmer. No, he was not a farmer. No. It's this this country is hard to make a living. Where this is, it's in rolling hills, mm -hmm. um, lots of draws, beautiful bottoms, you know, pastures, but rugged tree covered lands, and so it's hard to get the hundreds of acres you need under crop for you know. Uh, crops to really make a living so they were more doing what they needed and um, to sustain the family, sustain the family and, and horses and cattle were the primary it, the lands they liked the lands in this when they evidently dad told me when they came over from, from the trail of tears one of the reasons they settled up here and also this whole eastern oklahoma where the cherokee settled was because of the the similarities to north carolina and georgia where they came from mm -hmm. so it was um, that it, it's beautiful matter of fact it's just well, the same lands that the Grand Lake is covers. It's just down south of the dam. This this valley where the farm is continues, and it comes out right below where the dam is. 
So if the dam had been downstream a little bit farther, this would have been covered with water also. So, Were there other uh, structures on the property? Barns? Smokehouse? No, I think that... Outhouse about it. I mean, Dad added a barn in 1970. Uh, and there was no barn before that? You know, there was. There was a, what I recall as a kid in the 50s. Now, I don't know before that. You know, they had a couple of barns and chicken houses. Uh, had some corrals, and that's where we, when I was a kid, and I was born in 61, so when I was in the, in the 60s, when I was a young kid, we used to get all our granddad's cattle up and work them you know, a couple times a year. And that's some of my favorite memories is me and my cousins, and my dad's brothers uh, and sister's kids all getting together and helping work granddad's cattle. And uh, after we get through working the cattle, we get thrown on these calves and, you know, my dad and his uncles and his and his, and his brothers and stuff would great, take great. Uh, they'd laugh their butts off watching us get our butts bucked off those little calves with an ear in one hand and a tail in the other. But you know we, we worked hay, um, we brush hogged. We dad had a dozer down there, trying to keep the creeks in the in the line and, and and keep because that country down there, if you don't work it, it will grow back to. Mm-hmm. Wild wilderness within a few years, and so we've had to try to keep up the best we can. This is my husband during the World War Two in in Italy. Mm. That's where he went. And these are also, it's funny. They met. They didn't know they were there. From also the the county, Leo Albro. Who was the other one? Honey? I don't have the name. Um, Do you see any name? John Lee. Huh? John Lee. They're John. all. They're all high school. They were all friends. They're all the same high school. They all found each other in Italy in 1944. (laughs) Well, how did the the land finally pass down to your husband? Well, when uh, when his when my father-in-law died, there was eight children. Mm -hmm. They did, you know, they they talked about marshaling it. But how do you marshal? Who is going to say, well, I want this and that? And someone might end up with something. But by that not... time, my, my granddad had moved out of the home, done the yeah. farm. He... So this was in 74, 72. Uh, by that time, he had already moved to Jay, about 10 miles away. So they decided to put it uh, for sale at the courthouse, on the steps of the courthouse in Jay. And that's what it was put for bid. Everybody could bid, and my husband was one of the bidder and bid it higher than, than anyone else. And that's how he finally kept the... Very few people bid against him because my dad was going to buy it. Mm-hmm. Do so, you know it, how much he gave for it? Uh, yeah. I, I don't remember exactly. I've, mm-hmm. I've seen that number. But you know that was for the original 60. Over the years, though, up until that point, Dad had acquired lands around it. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of integral. He was going to buy it no matter what. Um, and this way, all and that the way, family. It's, it's, and we've had family reunions there. Like people have come, and and um, yeah, and it still remains. You know, anyone wanted to come, the family, you know, can come and visit. And all that. he had a sister put a. a I fa- love this home picture. On there for a couple of years, when she was older and didn't have any other place. And this shows my husband and and John Paul. <laughs> that's a great picture. And all the cattle, and that's the view from the house. Well, and. When you, you settled here to Oklahoma, were you living on the farm at all? No, we You're never lived on the farm. We came and we tried to find something in Jay okay. to buy or rent. We didn't find anything. This was 1961. Uh-huh. We didn't find absolutely nothing. So I was here one day to get my hair done. And <laughs> this one was in a little, you know, carry <laughs> a little baby. And uh, I told them I, we were looking for a place. So the owner, Miss Steele, she was one of the Teal girls, the owner of the beauty shop, said, well, I have a house for rent if you like it. And it was on, uh, what street was that? Seven. Huh? Seven. Seven, Seven Street. On Seven Street, downtown. And a brick house, very pretty, with uh, three bedrooms. Well, they had- Come back to Oklahoma to start a construction company, and that's where and we live here. So that's know. where we lived for uh, about three years before he finally bought the land here. He bought the whole city block here and built this house. Okay. But 
the farm had priority. We were there every weekend, every vacation. So we would spend weekends there. Well, what would be your job when you would go to visit the farm? What were, what were your chores? My, my chores were the inside of the house, you know, if it needed. But there was always somebody who was living there. Mm -hmm. Like my, uh, no, they were not there. Yeah. Just clean up the inside and try to, um, we had family reunions there. And, and I remember buying a large table so we would have room for all of us to, and it's still there, you will see it. And- uh, Would you have holiday celebrations there? Yeah, uh, yeah but like Easter, mm -hmm. Easter were there. And we would all the family go, all my nephews and nieces and my sister-in-law We still, we are really, of all the family, all the dicks, there's only two girls left and the two daughters-in-law myself and, and Betty. And by the way, Betty... Uh, Tarleton was my dad's, one of my dad's younger brothers. And yeah. uh, he worked at OSU, uh, was in the agriculture department forever. And actually his, um, his granddaughter, Rebecca, Ring, uh, Rebecca Ringsdahl, has been in the master's or PhD program in the agricultural program at OSU. So, mm -hmm. You know, but he, they lived in Stillwater. They would come here every weekend. They'd come see us and help us work our cattle at the old home place. They also had a place over in Drowning Creek, five miles as the crow flies or 10 miles as the road goes. And we would go over and help them work theirs. And they had the Drowning Creek running through their land. So, you know, the kids would, would play in that creek. That was a lot funner creek to play in than, than the creek that went through our land. But they would, you know, that was granddad's land. So we all always come over to granddad's and go hiking and hunting for birds and squirrels and, and whatever else. Um, and, you know, the, the land is populated with some turkey I, and a, maybe a few I black bear the over, over the there. years a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, some some cats, uh, obviously tons of deer. Uh, and it's, it's just a beautiful place. You know, it's a really nice, relaxing place to go to. Um, well, what were your chores when you would visit the farm growing up? <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Well, I'd help dad. We'd fix fence, would, would, work, would work cattle, would fix fence, would uh, yeah, they, a lot of fence. It seemed like we always had fences to fix. Um, you know, breaking the ice, uh, feeding the cows. Uh, back then was little square bales time. So Branding them? Yeah, we, every, I have every the, fall we'd, we'd, we'd work them. But, you know, during the summertime, that was my job. Uh, after I was about 12 years old, he'd drop me off with a pickup and a flatbed trailer and a couple of my buddies and we'd haul hay. So and then we'd come back and play baseball. But that's that was our kind of our jobs. And we learned how to eat cheese and Vienna sausages for lunch and um, it's a great way to grow up. Um, and you know, you you hunt and fish and, and you do everything else. But you know, you learn to ride horses and because that is rugged country and they wouldn't stay always in our fences, so we'd have to go through the you know, and mom was scared to death of, of us on horses. And one time we, um, dad and I were out chasing, I was probably six or eight, 10 years old, and chasing some cows through some of the brush, and you'll see that. <clears throat> and uh, we were hidden back from, uh, down, the, down the bottom, away around the corner where mom couldn't see us in the house. And we jumped across a little creek to get some cows, and I got hit by one of those hanging vines and knocked, knocked off. And the horse wants to go back where the food is. Doesn't have a rider, so the horse takes off, so dad grabs me, throws me back behind me, throws him, throws me behind him. And we're chasing after this horse, trying to catch it before it rounds the corner. Because if mom had seen that horse without me on it, <laughs> we would both had hell to pay. <laughs> so we, we catch the horse and drag it. Then he throws me back on the horse. And so we go back and get the cow. And we finally told mom about that you know, five years ago. So, <laughs> but it was also a place that, you know, dad employed a lot of people from Delaware County, kids, mm -hmm. um, either on the construction equipment, teach them how to work that, that and, and his concrete plant, their concrete plant, um, construction company, but also how to teach them how to, you know, work on tractors and drive tractors and do something. And he put a lot of, he employed a lot of people in that part of the world, taught them how to do things with themselves. So, he had uh, grow ready mixed concrete for 40, at least 40 years. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. From 62 long. till Until 10 years ago. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's the one who put the, 
the landing, how do you call that? That was the airstrip for the Grover Airport the back airstrip. in the early 70s. Twice he, he got to be that. Yeah, he was deep in construction. But the old home place is really, um, has been, you know, my brother, he owns, um, well, he has a house just on the hill above the oh, home place. He see. built that about six, seven years, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, he does some, he works around the country doing some different things, but he comes back there and his wife lives there all the time. And uh, it's a beautiful place to come home to. It's kind of tough with, with the bad weather, but it's a beautiful place to, to relax and it's a beautiful place to come back to and beautiful views, uh, very quiet, very dark. Um, but you know, Tommy loves it. He, he loves that place. He's worked it as much as almost as much as Dad has. I haven't been living in Oklahoma City and different places. I haven't had to work it as much, but uh, in the last couple of years. But uh, it's it's really a labor of love. Uh, but it's it's hard. I mean, it, farms are hard work. You can't just let them yeah work build themselves. And that's what Dad always taught us. And there's a lot of Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings I would have rather done anything else then go down there and break ice for the cat. When you turn 16 and can drive, he, Dad was on cruise control at that point because he had somebody to go take care of the things that, you know, were beneath him at that point. And I don't blame him. I did the same things with my kids when they turned 16. But uh, so it freed him up a little bit to do other things. But I can remember all those all those mornings and and Mom would come down there and she'd either come back in a separate car or we'd get back late at night and Mom would have dinner ready for us. And so she supported us being out there for 14, 16 hours a day in the weekends. And they had a full-time job at the concrete plant during the weeks. So there wasn't a lot of downtime, except when the Dallas Cowboys played. Do that was about remember, the only time my dad would ever. Maybe you don't remember. But at one time, I remember seeing um, goats. He had goats right after the, goats. you don't remember that. No. That was, he was too young. But he kept goats and my husband said, that was to keep the place clean. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. And uh, I don't know how long he kept them, but he had them there, I remember. And they were right after the entrance, you know, after the gate, on kind of a little hill. I remember that. You know, there wasn't all that much um, fence, all that many fences down there. Um, Maybe Tommy Lee might remember Tom, that. Tommy Lee remember a few things, obviously, that we don't. But you know, they also had cattle drives. It was still in the, in the mid-20s, early 30s. And I, it would take cattle 20, 30, 40, 50 miles at times. And um, it's not like now, but you know, my dad was eight years old and on a cattle drive. For he, gave, he gave each one of the boys a cow to, uh, no, a little one, <laughs> to uh, keep. And that money should go towards their college fund. So you remember 4-H or FSA No, I or? wasn't. You know, I kind of had, I kind of built in 4-H, you yeah. know, because every year we, we would have 150, 200 head of cattle. So we'd have 50 or 100 calves every year, which we would work and would sell. And, 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 and invariably, you always, every year or two, you'd have one heifer who died during childbirth. That just happens. Oh, and yes. so we would bring that calf and set up a, a pen here at the, at the house and that was my job raising the calf so the last thing i want to do after fixing fence all weekend was go to school and have to do more of that so <laughs> i kind of had had it built in i loved the farm i loved doing that i would but i i'd had my i had enough i remember that little calf we we had, well, a, we had a fence around or six it, right here in front of the house and you would go and feed her, feed well, the bottle. Yeah, a calf man in a bucket, you feed it. Yeah. Oh, God. So you do that. No, we had, we had five or six of them that we'd rest <coughs> over the years. Um, and they always, and you know, they were pets. So, and dad had that touch with horses also. And, you know, you heard about the horse whisper, and he was, he was that kind. No. When he, he would train the horses by scratching them on the back above the Boy. tail. Mm -hmm. And so he'd, he'd train, he'd gentle the horses when they were, when they were foals, when they were babies. So as they got older, and we always had 10 to 15, 20 horses at one given time. Did you see all the, all the saddles at the yeah. entrance? But he would train them by scratching them there. And so when he'd bring people to come see him, and he'd take them down to the farm and show off the farm a little bit, all of a sudden, as soon as they'd see, hear Dad's pickup, they would come running. And they'd get about just on a dead run towards Dad. And you'd see these people's eyes get big around, and all of a sudden the horses would get about 10 yards away and turn around and start backing up. So you'd have 20 
horses with our butts walking back towards dad. And, yeah. and you know, and, and those, everybody's used to getting kicked by horses and you hear all the stories. But dad would just sit there and just talk and scratch them all until they all had their fill and walk away. But he, he was back, like that with horses. Coming back to what I did, I used to drive the pickup while he would feed the bales of hay to the, to the cow. That was one of my, my jobs. Mm -hmm. He would be on the, you know, he would sit with the, with the hay in the pickup and feed the cow. It was a good place for us. It was a good place to get away. I mean, it, it would be, I think it's, it's more work when you're, when you live there and every morning you wake up, but it was a place for us to drive 30 minutes to go to. And it's also a place for the whole family. It was about, it's about an hour drive from here, isn't it? For you. It's about 30 minutes for everybody else, 40. Mama. Oh, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> so is it just the two brothers? Or do you have? Yeah, my, my, my brother, he's a couple years older than I am. And so uh, that's just two of us. But again, it was for the whole family and everybody. Oh, Tommy, well, he's have, older than that, honey. No, I'm not. <laughs> well, I'm not here to defend himself, so I'm going to say a few years older. But we also, you know, all the kid, all my cousins, I have some cousins in Tulsa that come down to hunt. And it's, it's for the family. It, and it's the way dad always looked at it. It wasn't his farm. It was the family's farm. He pays the taxes on it. He pays the upkeep for it. But he never and turned he down any family that wanted to come <coughs> shoot birds or go hunt or go camp out or do anything. It was always there because it was the family's farm where his dad and his granddad was born. and um, Or his, uh, I should say, yeah, his, his dad was born and his granddad had, had set up built a house so it was a uh, it's truly a family deal that continues with tommy and i uh, if we can afford yeah. to keep the upkeep and the younger <laughs> generation is very fond of the farm also yeah tommy I mean, has a couple children, of boys and i've got a couple uh, of kids yes and and some of my cousins since they sold their land on drowning creek some of those cousins you know they right. like still ha having a farm they can go to mm -hmm. and feel welcome at yeah so that's and that's good for the whole family, and, and hopefully we'll have some more family reunions down there. Uh, it doesn't have a pool or things like that are fun for the youngsters, but the, the older people in the family they still like going there and sitting underneath the tree and and um, and just feeling the, the breeze um, as it comes up the valley. It's really pretty. Is there a story behind the name? Uh, Thomas Jefferson Dick was, I think, my dad's granddad. He's the one that essentially built the house. And um, so it was the, the bar TJ. I'm not sure where the bar came from. It's just when I was a kid, I heard it was bar TJ. And it was Thomas Jefferson after that. So I think it's, it's here. Wouldn't that be I believe that is. Was Grove the closest town then for him to take things to market or to go get groceries or? Oh, uh, no, Jay. Well, actually, Disney, Langley, Disney, where Disney the dam Disney. was. And the dam was built, what, 1930, in the 1920s oh, and, and 30s, late 20s and 30s during the Depression. Uh, and so that is only about five miles away to the west of the farm. Okay. Uh, and that was probably the, the swing in his town back then because of the construction of the dam. Uh, Jay was about another seven or eight miles um, east. So, you know, they were probably, you know, they're in the middle of nowhere essentially there, but that was the closest two places to go, go to the market. Now, they got older, you know, Jay was the, was the, was the county seat, so that's where everything happened. And, you know, dad's best friend growing up was Jeff Muskrat, who, was a superintendent, ultimately was a superintendent of the Cherokee Reservation in Cherokee, North Carolina. But his dad, Jeff's dad, was the sheriff in Jay. So when the kids went to school, my dad and all of them went to school in Jay, Oklahoma. And so when they had ball games, instead of having to go back after basketball games and football games and things of that nature, they would uh, stay in the jailhouse there at the courthouse. That's where they'd spend the night and go back the next day back home. So, uh, you know, it's stories that it's hard to relate to now when we just jump in a car and, and go this somewhere. Was my they were riding horses and, mm -hmm. and, yes. and doing things, you know, just 70, 80 years ago. And did, then if Jay was the county seat, was there county fairs held there? I'm sure, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, now did your, your mother-in-law pass down any traditions to you? Any favorite recipes? Oh, yes. Oh, I have, I have a book. What is talking about? About, it, it must be there, but do you want me to find it? No, no. no. Okay, she gave me a book, a recipe book. I was still overseas when she sent that. And I asked my husband, is she afraid I'm going to starve you to death? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I remember, wonderful. And for Thanksgiving, the recipe for my turkey is halfway my mother-in-law and halfway my own mother. And I have a very good, very good recipe. Yeah, I use her recipe a lot. And, and her, my husband would also tell me how his mother would make cornbread or his favorite dish was cornbread with milk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all he wanted. And yes, yeah, I use the recipe. She was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Would she uh, quilt at all? I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But I wonder how she would have the time mm -hmm. with such a big <laughs> family, mm -hmm. you know, and, and working. Right. Teaching so, school. Oh, and she, yes. When uh, she was teaching that one classroom school, when finally, I don't know what year it was, uh, they decided that uh, the teachers should have uh, a degree. All she had was a graduation from high school, I think. So her parents sent her to Tahlequah. And the college in those days were, was called something else. You don't remember? I'm sorry, you were saying. Uh, my mother-in-law going to Tahlequah. Mm -hmm. And she had, she used to mention this beautiful, um, it was a lilac tree, or what kind of a tree was oh, it? With the big white flowers, right outside her window when she was in school over there. Mm. And that's where she got her degree to teach. And then one of my nieces, her granddaughter, ended up also in Tahlequah. Several of them ended up in Tahlequah. And, and she talked about that tree. That tree was still there. Probably so I love that story. Probably. A magnolia? Was it Probably, a magnolia? yeah. That's what it looks like. Awesome. But anyway, she came back and she had her degree. On top of everything else. I don't know how she did it. Would she uh, do a lot of canning? Well, of what? Canning yes. from the oh, garden? Yes. Oh, gosh. When uh, when we came back to stay here and she passed away, we went in and we still ha had stuff that she had canned, mm -hmm. a lot of canning. And her daughters, most of them are very good cooks. Most of the daughters, you can tell that they were, they were trained properly. <laughs> now, now, did you have an agricultural background before you moved to Oklahoma? <laughs> well, the only background I had, no, I'm a city girl. I'm not <laughs> going to lie about that. But uh, the only, my sister married, who was older than I am, married uh, a farmer. He was, I don't know if you can call that a farm, it was a plantation. Mm. But he also had cattle. And the plantation was, oh, castor oil beans. Mm. And in those days, I'm talking about, I don't know. 50, you know what mommy little store right here was just mentioning? More 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, castor oil beans was the beginning of the nylon. They made nylon with it. They made all those things. So it was a big, and we used to go by, with my parents. I was still single. We would go and spend weekends over there in that, in that farm. Mm. That was my first. Two. And also we had friends who were farmers. So we had, their farm was uh, mostly oranges. You know, they, they export oranges. Right. Morocco and Spain mm -hmm. were the first. So I remember those days also. But that's about all. Now my, my father was a pharmacist and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> but we enjoyed going, always going. It was a, a privilege to be able to go and spend a weekend in a farm. You were mentioning that story earlier. I just noted that my granddad uh, Jeff had taken Cleo by buggy to Tahlequah Women's College. And they were talking about making yes, trees. That's right. I remember. So Tahlequah that. Women's College, so she could get a, and it would take it by buggy. So this would have been back in the that's, it's, early it's 1900s. Great, great so. Hmm. Yeah. They had a wonderful, a wonderful family, and then finally, of course, they would go to church, 
every Sunday and they would use the body and all that. But finally, my father-in-law bought a, a, a car. Mm. And I don't know what year that was. Oh, but uh, my husband said that he never had taken a driving lesson. I said, why did you? Well, he took the car and drove it in the pasture until he got the feel of it. And, and that's then how we our kids how to drive too. <laughs> Just give them standard transit, you know, an old truck. I say, go, get, go in the field and so you'd hear them grinding away for two or three hours. That's how my kids learn how to drive. <laughs> When, when did the farm get its first tractor? Oh my. Oh my goodness. Well, yeah, I've heard that story and I don't, I really wish I could remember. Now, we've got four or five tractors down there now, a couple of which actually work. Yes, but. Um, but yeah, granddad, they really didn't have one until dad put one on it. Oh yes. I remember the storytelling where my husband was holding the handle of what? It wouldn't be a tractor, would it? No, it'd be a, for, a, for a horse. Yeah. No, for no, it was a machine that all the, even Betty remembers that. And uh, he could he could barely reach the handles of that uh, plow. 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 That's it. So he was very young when he started working in the fields. Mm -hmm. And they all did. But I don't know when he bought his truck. I don't know. It's rugged country, lots of rock. It's, be it's beautiful, but it's rugged country up and down, and the trees grow quick. And so, I have uh, we've, gone, we've gone through a couple of brush hogs and several tractors, and it's, it, 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 could tear, it could tear up a crowbar. If you, you know. Now, I have a sister-in-law who lives in Tulsa, Carrollson. Now, she lived a few years in that, uh, well, she, I think she got married when she was very really young. But she lived in that farm. Now she's in Tulsa. And uh, she, could, she could give us more information. Any conservation work like kerosene or, or they, that we, type of thing? They have a little bit with, uh, with the county and the state as far as some of the, uh, when they had some of the droughts in the past on some of the ponds. Uh, but you know, that, 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 as you'll see, it's pretty rugged country. And there's not a lot of, I mean, it's it's tough to dig. Uh, there hasn't been a lot done down there. We probably need, to, I probably need to do more with the county and, and the state on, on some of those things. My brother and I have just tried to kind of maintain what, what dad left us. Well, what ponds there are, were they man-made or? Both. Both. There were some that were, were just, are just natural from the curvatures of some of the creeks that have, have left ponds. And then dad created three or four ponds on the lands for the cattle and for the animals. Uh, John, how about that other painting with the cow and the pond? That's up in the flats, isn't it? Probably so. Was that part of no. the 60 acres? No. No, we bought no. that. I have another large painting of um, the uh, pond and uh, and a cow and several cows. If you want to, I can show it to you. It's, it's hanging in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. And my uh, brother-in-law passed away told me that he remembered that cow exactly because she had a kind of a white spot on her face. And so I have that also. I, those are the only two paintings I have of the farm. Oh, any idea of how record keeping was done through the years? Yeah, that kept pretty good records. Yes, probably, but we have we were able to find all this, but we could look some more. Oh no, I mean, was it you done know, by hand? Did he just write it in ledger books or? You know, husband, he never really kept track of the money, but he always kept track of the horses and the cattle. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's right. He, he would know exactly which horse. He could look back at the record. He, and, you know, of course, he knew them backwards and forwards. And so he always made sure all the records with the American Four Horse Association or, mm -hmm. or with the, the Herefords or this, that, and the other, the Charlays that we had. He always, Angus, we, he always had those records, but as far as the money goes, I don't think he kept a whole, a lot of track of that. I don't think he wanted mom to know what he was spending down there. <laughs> Did he have a brand? Do you have a yes, Marty J. And we've got oh, that. Yes. We've got that and I have the, I have the seal, what you would use like on a letter. I have that here somewhere. And, and I have the, the authorization to use that brand by the, I don't know, the agriculture department, I suppose it is, but... Uh, Has the neighbors changed through the years? Were there many neighbors in the oh, area? Yes, well, yes. No, no. 
Well, he acts like it. Yes and no. There's a there's a few homes. There's a home every half mile mm -hmm. or so or mile, probably every half mile. And there's a a few of them have moved out and a few have moved in over the years. But for the most part, I can remember since since I was a kid, one new house being built down there. Uh, and it burned down. They rebuilt it. But some of the same families, the Buzzards family, uh, the uh, I'll think of the other families here in a few, a few minutes, but there are several families who still have lands since, since I recall, for at least for the last 50 years. Um, so there's not that many people down there. It's pretty quiet. Uh, and was, was church an important part? Of I think church was a very important part to my to my dad, uh, to uh, my dad's mother. She made sure that they all got dressed up and went because the Gray Schoolhouse I think doubled as a church, mm -hmm. and so. I think in that part of the world it was at that time. Still is, but I mean, talk about when my dad was growing up. Right. I think grandma made sure they all had a good education, religious. You can you open this? Sure. Did, yes, did your grandmother ever talk about Christmas programs in the one room school or pie suppers or? Oh yeah, the five suppers. I remember them talking. My 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 uh, husband talking about that. Yes. It was a little. It was a community that everybody. Uh, that was one thing Mom mentioned earlier. Was that the one thing that Dad would always talk about was that your family wasn't just your relatives. Your family was everybody essentially that you knew within five or ten miles. You would help them out if they were if they needed help if they needed help with their cattle if they needed food you'd take them food if you you know there's always kids spending the night over from other families everybody helping each other out if somebody's uh, giving birth or if they had some problems with their cows it was just um, you know granddad my granddad Jeff uh, and, and my dad they all that was a big part of it you couldn't just live alone. As a hermit down there, you were part of one big community, which may be, you know, not that many people. Several, maybe a couple hundred people, but that would be their 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 universe, which would stretch from Jay to, to Langley and down to um, Topsy and and, and that, that whole Drowning Creek area. That's where they grew up, and that was before the before the lake was in there. So they would know places where to to cross the Grand River. The Grand River is only a couple miles away. Um, so that was before the, the dam was, was built. So uh, they would cross on over and go over to the Nita. Uh, there were certain places that, that were shallow water where they would cross the river with cattle if they needed to or with horses, uh, with wagons. Um, so the, you know, it was a different world. It was, uh, it, was, it was fun. It was great stories to listen to. Any visits from county agents or home demonstration agents or? That I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Well, they, I'm sure they did. I, I mean, know they went there to take a picture of the house. <laughs> <laughs> they told me that. There may have been a few, the county, the county there may have been a few game rangers stop by every <laughs> once in a while. I don't, some, some of the neighbors really didn't have a season that they adhered to. Any uh, interactions with the state in terms of regulations or? Well, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but one of my brothers-in-law, younger than my husband, uh, was in uh, Vietnam, was in Saigon, I think, was working. He was a military and he was working at the American Embassy okay. when it was bombed. Mm -hmm. And uh, while he was there, I don't know how long he stayed, maybe a year, then his wife and babies we're living at the farm with just, yeah, the, the babies. Two instead, the third one wasn't born. Uh, lived with my father-in-law, who was a widower already. So she lived at the farm with her mother, her father-in-law and the children. That was the involvement with, you know, the as, war. As far as the county that. agents and things right. of that nature, I don't, I don't recall. Um, I have a bad call, talk to them every once in a while when we'd have some issues or, but uh, pretty much self-sufficient down there. Did their own veterinary work? Yes. Yeah. Unless there was a, 
unless there was a, the, you know, I, you learn how to use a come along for a lot of things as far as pulling calves out of cows or out of horses or things of that nature. So there's a lot of, you know, because you're down the sticks and, and 30, 45, 50, you know, hour drive by a vet on a weekend night, uh, you're going to lose, you're going to lose the animal. So dad was a pretty good vet in his own right, uh, as, as most farmers are. Did you pull any calves? No, I didn't. <laughs> but once it was out, I spread the newspaper on the back of our, of our um, station wagon, and we put the little calf there because the mother died mm. giving birth. And we brought her, and Mary Jane was, was here. Mm -hmm. Mary Jane was a friend, a friend's daughter from Europe. And for a graduation present, her mother sent her to spend two weeks with us here in this house. And of course, we were going to the farm as much as we could. And she was there when that little calf was born and the mother died. And she helped, you know, with the newspapers and bring them. So we called the little calf Mary Jane. <laughs> that was the name. And that's the one who grew up here and that he was feeding with the mom. Well, we had, we had several. Now, her. she was born, you know, where, where we had the, where there's one, the picture of that cow, we can, we can go down and there is like a, the water running. Oh, JP, do you have any lessons that your father passed down to you about being a good steward of the land and taking care of the land? And... Oh, sure. I mean, you learn growing up with it how important it is, and you, and you learn the sense of family by what it's, it's not just yours, for one thing. And, you know, like Dad always said, they're, never, they're not making any more land. So, Leave it, keep it in the family. Uh, so everything I, I told my kids that I may not leave them any, any money when I pass away, but they'll have a farm, um, or at least my share of it. And it's it's very important to to take care of it and to learn from it. My kids, I, you know, I, I'd bring them up here. They'd play in the creeks and they'd learn how to drive on the fields and they'd hike through the, you know, and see all the deer and everything. And that's important for them. And in hard work and and getting up at five in the morning and sloshing through snow to go feed yeah. the cows. And, you know, that's the kind of things that you you and don't grow up when we told complaining them, about. You just go do it. I don't remember ever being yeah. really that cold or really that mad about it because Dad said that was what had to be done. Mm -hmm. so when we told the them ethic. about the interview, they were very, very excited. I called them. They are both in college. And I called her both of them, and they are very excited. They said, that's cool. <laughs> but you learn to appreciate the, oh, yeah. what it means to have a farm, and especially the Centennial Farm, and how it goes back generations. And you, you, know, you can feel the uh, you can feel the family, the ghosts of the family still. What's nice about the old home place is you can really get on the front porch, which they didn't really have the, the front porch. My brother added that. And then they had like a little stoop out in front. And he had a front porch covered, which is really nice. But you can sit out there and really feel the breeze, even on a hot day, and feel the breeze that cools you off. And kind of, you're looking at what they looked at 100 years ago when they, were, when they had built the house, which is a very cool feeling. Um, I heard Patrick said his son, when he was maybe 12, 13 years, he told my, I was there, he told my husband, he said, Papa, this is where I want to retire when I grow old. Yeah. I didn't, were you there? He doesn't know how hard it is to work that land, but yeah, that's what he wants to do. <laughs> you know, and, and kids, kids need that. I, I, I'm glad I was able to share that with my kids. And, and um, I didn't, we didn't live here, so they didn't get to enjoy the, enjoy the, uh, the early mornings and the ice breakings and stuff like that. They, they helped with the fences, they helped work the cattle, and they helped do some things over the years. So they got a, a, a taste of it. Not the full taste, but enough that they, if, if that's part of their heritage now, and they want to continue. Would you spend the night out there with your grand, grandparents when you were younger? Yeah, I don't and remember really. Uh, you what? know, ask me if I ever spent the night at the farm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I don't remember a lot of that, uh, quite frankly. I wish I wish I had a better better memory of the past, but 
I was just curious about breakfast <laughs> on uh, the farm. Uh, this family, this family could eat breakfast. <laughs> I don't remember a, a morning that I didn't have ham and eggs and biscuits, or uh, or bis uh, or bacon or something. I, that was just unheard of. If you didn't have breakfast or you only had a piece of toast or a donut, that's just mom got up every morning and made it and when we all had the whole families together and we had our family you know had the reunions or not even really a reunion we'd say we're going to be down at the farm and people would show up with picnic baskets in the afternoon when we're working cattle or we're brush hogging and they'd show up and we'd throw the, the water or the pops in the in the creek to keep them cold um you know you didn't Everybody ate. It was it was it was kind of cool because there was a couple of big trees. Dad would clear, dad or granddad cleared a lot of the bottoms out so you could actually brush hog and and have hay and things like that. But he they kept a few of the trees. Dad didn't like clear cutting, just big swaths of land. He'd always keep a tree every once in a while, a big walnut tree or a big pecan tree or something like that. So those were great places to go, and people would set up underneath it. And so when we'd take a break from work, mom would be there. Or, or my aunt Betty, and and because the kids would, you know, their uh, my cousins would be out there working with us. So that I, that's a lot of my memories. Is uh, I remember him taking the his two children because they're only 15 months apart, the boy and the girl, one on each arm, and climbing up the yeah that devil's is, devil. There's a there's, devil, there's a ridge what called Devil's call Humpback. Devil. Devil's Humpback. Humpback. And um, and that's where all the there's some some rock formations, a little a little. I don't want to say a cave because it doesn't really go back in very far, but it's it's underneath and it's very cool. It's a uh, big old big all rock, over the place. limestone overhang. There were some we found some um, uh, some arrowheads, and so every time when my kids were young, in the wintertime we'd do it because in the summertime it's, it was too snaky. But in the wintertime we'd we'd always climb up the hill, climb up that ridge, it's almost straight up, and we'd sit there for a couple hours and we'd cook and we'd make a fire up there and the kids felt like they were camping out like the Indians did. And um, then we'd, you know, we'd, we'd see a lot of critters. Um, and so the, the kids remember that probably more than anything. I do too. And dad said, I said, dad won't, and dad was probably my age when I was doing this to my kids 30 years ago or 20 years ago. And he, I said, dad, you want to go up there with us? And no, I did that when I was a kid. And when I, I, I swore to myself back then, I'd never do it again. Because it was straight, it was straight up a hill, so you had to have young legs to be able to do that, and be able to breathe for a couple hours. But that whole land is pretty rugged, uh, and we'll, I wish it wasn't raining so much, so I could really take you on a nice two or four wheel drive wise around. Because we have roads all the way through the lands, um, where you can get back in the back. And I'm afraid the creeks are going to be up, and the, we'd get bogged down, and I don't want to have to have somebody come get us with a tractor and pull us out. But we can go to some of the places today. When, when your husband died, what happened to the ownership of the land? To the what? To the farm. You see the owner. Well, it was uh, he was the owner of the farm. Oh. I was too. Okay. So automatically, it was uh, it, it's mine now. Okay. Because everything we we had been made fifty six years, and every time we bought something, whether it was land, house, cars, it was always with right to survivorship. If I had died first, my husband would have had everything. He died first, so I have everything. But one thing I know for sure, and I always told my husband, I will never sell that farm, never. It will pass on to them, to the next generation, God willing, I'm not going to sell that. So in the next 100 years, what do you see happening to the land? Well, I think it would be the third generation, for me, I'm, I'm my, the last generation, then his generation, then it probably will be his children, I suppose, if they are able to, to keep it. And I, I'm sure they will. I'm pretty sure they will. So it'll go on that way. Because they are both, they will be able to afford it. They are both in college, doing very well. One is graduating next week, um, next month. The other one is, He's still going further. He's going for his, he already has his master. And so they will be able to afford it. And uh, well, actually there'll be the two of them. That's well, all. you know, Tommy has a couple of, a couple of boys also that spend a lot of time there and, and hopefully they'll, you know, they have, they have the same 
they have the same love for it also. And, and between my two and Tommy's two and quite frankly, some of the cousins and the, I, oh, yeah. we're going to do everything we can. And hopefully uh, down the road, we'll be able to do some things to keep it perpetual to pay the taxes and do the upkeep and have a little money set aside. Right now, I'm making sure mom's taken care of before we do too much in the farm. At least the 60, the original 60. Yeah, you know what, and, it's, and really you, you kind of get spoiled by having all 530 because they complement each other. Because the 60 is in one, is, and you'll see this is the house and the bottom as it goes uh, due south. But then you're, you're cutting off a couple of great fields where we had alfalfa and things of that nature uh, and, and hay. And then you're cutting off some of the, the, the devil's humpback and you're cutting off, you know, another parcel of land has the spring that never, uh, it's never gone dry. Um, and so the 60 is very important because that's the start. Oh, that yes. was the heritage, but, but you, it's, it's kind of like cutting off one arm. You don't, you don't want to lose that arm. You want to keep the whole, you want to keep the whole body. I wonder how many of these allotments have remained, you know, mm -hmm. have remained whole like that. Well, your, your father, your husband had some foresight, uh, to buy the land around oh, it. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, he did. And was able to. Right. An interesting we story. Never, we never had to borrow money to, to buy anything. An interesting story is that there was a 40-acre tract adjacent to the original 60, but inside of some of the other lands my dad bought had been also adjacent. But there was a 40-acre tract that was owned by a uh, full-blood family, um, uh, McLaughlin, I think it was. And I think I found that title. You know, I, I looked at, ever since I talked to you, that's all I've been doing. <laughs> and Dad, they, they were they were smack dab. They had lived in a home. They lived in an old cabin, being kind. They had water. Their water well was about 100 feet away. They had coal. They didn't have electricity. They lived, and this was, I remember this when I was, this would be maybe 30, 40 years ago when I was, 10, 20 years old, these people were still living there. And they had a daughter that lived in Jay that would bring them supplies. Um, were they the one making the quilts that Linda uh, kept buying? I think so, probably. Okay. And so, but dad ended up buying the land from them. Uh, but told them, I remember but that. But gave them life, life tenantship. So this is your land, you're here. That's right. We bought the land, we're gonna, we're gonna hunt around you, but you can stay you have, as long you have as in, you want to. You, have, you, know, you can get in and out. We'll maintain the roads for you. You yes. stay here as long as you want to. You live here till you die. But they sold it to Dad on that basis. They lived live another 10 years or so. Uh, and then they house. disappeared. Why then one day they weren't there. Hmm. It was it was kind of... We don't know what happened. And so the old home finally just kind of crushed underneath snow, I think, one day. and uh, But the old home site, and it, it was tucked into a little 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 draw that you couldn't have found that if you were looking for it unless you knew exactly where to look. Hmm. So um, that was kind of an interesting little side note, but it, they didn't speak any English. They, they spoke, they were just full blood Cherokees and didn't speak a lick of English. So the, the daughter was, was bilingual in English and, and Cherokee. So dad spoke a little bit of Cherokee and he could kind of converse with them a few things, but uh, we'd see them down there. We'd see the smoke coming out of the, uh, coal would come out of, their, out of their chimney, or fire. Now, was those the McLaughlin's? I think it was McLaughlin's. Hmm. Were, were both grandparents Cherokee then? Both of, or just, do you know? Uh, granddad, Jeff, dad's dad, was three quarters Cherokee, and... Dad was, my dad husband was, was one sixteen. No, oh, three sixteenths. Three, okay. Three sixteenths. So... Granddad was three eighths. I don't know. His mother, dad was three quarters, and then I think mom, uh, my grandmother was. Uh, I don't think she was. I think she great, was. Actually, I think they gave the allotment to the to the great grandmother. Just, I think she was a widow, yes. and she had a son, and that's the reason. Thomas Jefferson. Huh? Yeah, Thomas Jefferson. Is that right? Yeah, that was right. the son okey. who got the allotment from that's the mother the because the allotment was mm -hmm. done back after the Trail of Tears. And then he's the one that built the house, um, and he died at an early age when he was 35, 40 years old. And then, then granddad, By dad's then, dad was born there in 1892, and then, and then, uh, then dad was born there in 21. Mm -hmm. 
So is today the the farm just pure recreation, or are you still running cattle? No, unfortunately, the fences are. One of these days, my brother and I will get the fences back out. Um, we're both have full time jobs, and it's a part time. It's a recreation. But expensive. you hope to do it this summer. Yeah, we're we're going to try to line up. We've we've done some other things. You know, we fixed the house up a couple of years ago. That time took took most of the budget, and then uh, we did some things on the equipment and kind of fixed up some, sold some, and so uh, this year we're going to try to do the fences, and then hopefully next year with the fences fixed, we can maybe get some calves back down there. You still have the tractor. Yeah, yeah we still have a couple of tractors, and you know, we have we still have the equipment. We have a. Yes, because when my husband passed away, he, he still had the, all our business, grow ready mix concrete. And so I told the boys, I said, now you, before we, we had an auction sale for the, our business. And I told them, I said, before we sell, you, you guys see what you need for the farm. And so they made sure that they had Yeah, all we needed, we, we, you know, a trailer. trailer when you need to haul some stuff, you need a trailer, so. Yeah. We already had most of the tractors and stuff down there. We need to build another barn down there to house some of the equipment. But um, there is a big barn now. Well, there is, yeah, and we shored up. There was a barn that was built. Dad built back in the late '60s that uh, was about to fall apart. We, I, so he redid it. Well, yeah, we had some guys come in about three or four years ago and kind of fix that back up. So uh, there's some other things, but it, it's a continual process. Mm -hmm. And plus, if you don't keep things brush hog, those trees will come back and all of a sudden you lose a whole whole field. So my brother did a lot of work trying to keep it up the last couple of years while he was off and on from working. And um, hopefully this summer we can get some guys down there to help us do some more things, do some more fencing. And uh, It's challenging. It is, it, it, you know, but it, you got you, you, you have to do it. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want it to go back to wilderness dad and granddad and everybody worked too hard over the years and and we did also to get it to where it is now you hate to see it recede but you can only do so much time and money wise and it's and it is expensive you know you fix a tractor and it's a few thousand dollars and you get another tire it's a few hundred dollars and you you know brush hog and that's another ten thousand you know it just it can it kind of adds up so you have to just work it like a business and um and budget your time and budget your your expenses, but it's worth every every penny. Uh, you 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 kind of look at your bank account, but when you're down there and you look, and you're sitting there and you're looking out of the valley and you feel the breeze, it's all worth it. Good memories. Oh yeah. Well, do you have anything else you'd like to tell us before we end today? I think there's there will always be enough dicks to keep that place going. <laughs> yeah. Well, mom, mom's been the the shepherd of dad, <laughs> making sure that you know he always he'd go down there you know, without food, and she'd bring food down to him, you know, and, and always have food waiting when she didn't go down there, and and so she always made sure that we all were taken care of. So she's always been the shepherd for well, the whole family, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. The, Dad's brothers and sisters and all their families. And there's a whole the family is big, right? a bunch of cousins and lots of boys. Now my sister-in-law, Betty, has three boys, doesn't mm -hmm. she? And a daughter. No, two boys. No, three. They all went to OSU. Okay. All four of them went to OSU. Uh, Carol Sue has grandkids a, going to OSU. Carol Sue has four boys, I think. So they they are. No, three boys and a daughter. His brother has three sons. And all the kids spent time son. there. That was the cool thing. All my cousins, I had a bunch of cousins my, within five or so years of my age. And so that was the fun part between Uncle Kenneth and Uncle Charlton's farm and on Drowning Creek and our farm. All the cousins grew up hunting, fishing, chasing crawdads, uh, working on the farms, messing with cattle, riding horses. There's a whole, my generation all had that. And we need to probably do a better job of making sure that the next generations do that as well. Keeping that connection. Keeping that connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's harder to do in today's times, mm -hmm. but we need to make more of a focus to, to do it. None of them try to make a living out of it. There's no way you can. It's hard. It's hard. Mm -hmm. You can. It'd be they nice if there was some oil underneath it. It'd make farming a lot easier. Ever any speculation ever? Or? No, no. Uh, I'm in the oil and gas business actually, and 
Mother Nature gave us a great, uh, great topography mm -hmm. and great surface, but it has we have all the water in the world underneath us and beautiful trees and draws and valleys, but uh, she kind of shorted us on the uh, oil and gas mineral <laughs> side. So you know you get on one hand and you don't get on the other hand. So some of those other places out in western Oklahoma that aren't quite as pretty to my eye as some of our land. Uh, but their minerals are a lot prettier than our minerals, so. Well, we appreciate your time today. Thank you so Thank much you. For, for joining us and sharing the story of the Bar TJ I wish Ranch. Had more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wish you'd been, I wish this had happened a couple of years ago when dad was still alive. You wouldn't have had enough, you'd have to bring more tapes. <laughs> well, and, um, we could tell that your passion for the land oh, yeah. and, and his passion as well. Yeah, and the rest of the family is just as passionate as we are. I never heard any of my relatives or nephews or cousins say, we don't like that place. They all love it. Well, they were all, they were all very appreciative that dad looked at it like he did. That, that was for the family, not, yeah, for, the, could have, not for himself. It mm -hmm. could have been sold, you know, that everybody was bidding on this. Right. But in those days, they didn't have any money. <laughs> so, well, and, and everybody well, knew that dad was going to buy it. What year was, was it? it was, that better? would have to be 74. Mm -hmm. No, not much money. Dad died, the granddad died in 72 or 73. Yeah. So that was about a year after that. But uh, it was, it's, it's a And he was, thing. my father-in-law was a typical Indian. You know, he was calm. He was very... Stolen, I never, quiet. I never heard him say one bad word about anybody, you know, and uh, he, would, he adored children. So. Yeah, he was, he was, um, with his cowboy hat on, on a horse. He was quite the. Yeah. You know, he, he was he, yeah, you, something out of a movie. You know what I mean? He had yeah. that chiseled, the Cherokee Indian face with the hat on, he's straight I, up on a on a horse <laughs> and looking over. I, I, I remember that view of him and it's very pretty. I have a picture of him on a horse and then John Paul and a little boy, the, the little, the kids always had a little horse. <laughs> and I think, my gosh, they look like uh, uh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. <laughs> I have a picture of that. Well, anything else? I don't think so. I can. Well, thank you for coming and doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.